Okay, so this month we're going to look at a an audio programming framework called Marcius. And if you're like me, you're probably thinking like, what what is what is Marcius? And it turns out it's a, a figure from Greek mythology that is central figure in two stories involving music. So that's where they got their their project name from. And uh, this is an open source project that's out on GitHub as near as I can tell. This uh, started as a research project for a graduate student who used it as part of his studies. And it's been uh, picked up and used by some different applications. So it's not just a library that he created on his own that's only used by him. Uh, he's got a, uh, if you go to uh, marcius.info, let's make this a little bigger. Uh, he's got documentation out here. He's got a tutorial, which we'll look at in a second, a user manual, development, a developer manual, cookbook, uh, Doxygen, C++ library reference. And um, fundamentally, this is a framework for kind of interactive prototyping and experimentation. It can do both analysis and synthesis. And uh, as we'll see here in a second, um, you can quickly iterate with your idea without having to recompile and relink and, and run the executable over and over again because it's got a little scripting language built into it. And this is important if you're doing your own specific audio analysis task because the odds are that somebody has already written something canned that's going to do exactly what you want is going to be low, right? So you're going to need to prototype and iterate and you want to go through that uh, experimental, experimentation cycle as quickly as you can so that you can quickly focus in on something that works and discard things that don't work without having to waste a lot of time. So if we uh, skip over here to his tutorial documentation, uh, go th I'm not going to go through the install steps since I've already done that. And um, it comes with a series of command line executable utilities and some graphical utilities. And we will, I will show you how to run it and then we'll um, discuss how to get it built and uh, get the dependency libraries installed on your machine uh, before we go and look at some source code. But I've got a command prompt window over here. So if I go into my build directory, I've built a, uh, a debug version of the library. And if we look at executables we've got in here, we've got this Marcius run, which is what they're saying in tutorial to try out. So if we try that, my fingers always want to type Mary instead of Marcius. It's kind of an interesting name. All right, so I've got all whatever DLLs and stuff I need, obviously, are in my debug folder. And um, I get the same output as shown in the tutorial. Now, Marcius run works off of running a little script. The script is going to define a data flow graph of nodes, basically. So if we go over here, I've got a simple one. I think I typed all these and saved them in. Um, the first one is test. I've got the file name argument pointing to a file on my machine. And uh, so if I do Marcius run test.mrs, hopefully you guys, if the audio is working everything correctly and I hooked it all up, you guys heard that little beginning of that song. So if you, if you guys give me an indication if you heard that or not, make sure I got it all connected up correctly. Okay, it, it's a it's a sound sound file song from a uh, music artist called Panic. The album is called 
Neurons Fire at Will came out in 2005, and it's the song Heavy Working Robot. It's just an MP3 file that I've got stashed off uh, that I downloaded from the internet. It's um, freely available. I can share the URLs if somebody wants to go and listen to that album. Um, it's from uh, the demo scene, if you're familiar with that. Anyway, point is, we had something called a, a series group, and then this little arrow sign, and then sound file source, and there appears to be some kind of parameter here to the sound file source, whatever that is, and then there's an, another arrow, and the audio sync. And when we run that using Marcius Run, we obviously heard the file playing back. So what Marcius is, I'm gonna I'm not gonna read their documentation line for line. You can go and check it out yourself. But what Marcius does is set up a flow graph for audio processing. So a flow graph represents a stream of streams of data and uh, no processing nodes that are consuming and generating the streams of data. If they uh, both consume and generate, they tend to be a transforming processor. But some processors act as sources of data. So this sound file source processor has a file name parameter that tells it which sound file it's going to uh, be sourcing. And then it results in a stream of data coming from that sound file shipped to the nodes that are downstream of the sound file source node. So this dash greater thing here is connecting up the nodes and in this in this uh, first example, let's scroll back up here. In this first example the the nodes were arranged in series. So we start with nothing and then have a, a sound file source node that acts as a source of the sound data from this file name and that is fed into the audio sync node which plays it out through the speakers. Now obviously there's more interesting things that we want to do than just play a sound file right because that's I, I can do that with you know Windows Media Player or VLC or any, any number of audio players that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is to take um, multiple streams of data, put them through processors, and try to analyze some kind of property or feature of the sound that we can then use for other purposes. So in, a more, in an extremely advanced example, you might be interested in say, I want to process this audio and I want a machine learning algorithm to tell me whether or not the audio is people talking or whether it is music. And then I'm going to do one thing when it's people talking. I'm going to do something else when it's music. Now, um, that's a fairly advanced scenario, but it is something that Marcius can do. But we're not going to start with the more advanced example. We're going to start with simpler examples. So the next thing um, that we look at here in the tutorial is... Um, what if we do, instead of a sound file source, what if we do a sine wave source? Then the, the uh, sound wave, or the, sorry, the sine wave will be put through an amplifier with gain. <coughs> Excuse me. Put through an amplifier with gain. And then we will clip the result of the amplifier. Clip thing, so... Th Everything in here is assumed that the the range of the sound samples is in the range is normalized in the range of minus one to one. So we just took a sine wave that went from minus one to one. We applied a gain of ten to it. So now that sound wave goes from minus ten to plus ten. And then when we run it through clip, it basically chops off the peaks so that now we have a signal that goes from minus one to one again but it's basically a chopped off sine wave the one pole node is a a single lobed filter if you don't know what 
a filter is in terms of audio processing, you just think of it as something that either drops high frequencies or it drops low frequencies and passes the rest. So here, put things through that clipped waveform through a one pole filter and then put a gain of 0 0.04 on it to lower the volume back down. If it's the, if when, when Marcius puts things through the audio sync, if it has a value of one, it's the maximum volume, right? So this, this final gain stage is to lower the volume back down on things so it's not blowing out our eardrums when we play this back. So over here, I think I saved this as series. Yes, so um, here I've just I've changed the frequency of the sine wave source just as I was experimenting around. So if we try this, Marcius run series.mrs, we hear a sine wave. <coughs> so we can have algorithmic sources, sine wave source. We can have processing nodes, a gain node, a clip node, a one pole filter. We can chain them all together. So all of these things are in series. So everything, the output of the previous stage was fed into the next stage and finally down into audio sync to get it out the speakers. But not everything you want to do is a linear chain of processing steps. Sometimes you need to do, uh, you need to take the same data and process it two different ways. So the way you do that is to use a uh, parallel processing node. These these parallel and series nodes are called composite systems. They call ev they, every node is is def described as a MAR system and a a Marcius system. And uh, it turns out that over here under Marcius info, we can say list. Uh, let's try it this way. Let's try help. So if we say list MAR systems, it'll dump out a list of all the nodes that are each of these nodes is a Marcius system, a MAR system. So these are all the systems that the uh, software knows about out of the box. And you'll see that there's quite a bit. So there's quite a bit of functionality in terms of these uh, processing nodes that is available to you out of the box. And obviously you can write your own. We will look at what this looks like in source code in a little bit. But let's just stay looking at the understanding this little scripting language. So here they've taken sound file source that feeds into a parallel composite which replicates the input to all of the nodes listed in the parallel curly braces. So one of them goes to a delay samples with a delay of zero and the other one goes to a delay samples with a delay parameter of 10,000. And then all of that uh, result from the parallel goes into audio sync. So if we, here's that little sound file, or uh, that scripting s example of how to use the parallel. So if we do Marcius run parallel, you can hear, if you're listening on headphones, that the one channel was no delay and the other channel had delay so you kind of were hearing the same thing but with out of, out of the two different uh, channels but uh, with a delay between them now um, sometimes what you want to do is uh, combinations of series and parallel operations and you want to take parallel streams and mix them back down into a single stream and so with the sources processors and sinks that are built in this is uh, relatively easy so um, here they're talking about you know this is a sound file source the audio sync goes to the speakers 
but you can sync to a sound file and get audio from the microphone if you wish to do that. So just because we were getting a source from a programmatic generator like a sine wave or because we were getting it from a file, we can also get audio from the microphone. We can sync things to files as well as to the speakers. Um, if you have two sources in a row, it turns out that the second source will just replace whatever the contents of the first source was. But if you have two outputs in a row, the or two syncs as they call them, the first sync will do whatever it w it will send the data to wherever it is syncing it, but then it also sends the data on its output. So here we got the file or we got the uh, data from the source from a sound file. Then it was sync sunk sunk I guess sunk to the speakers and sent further downstream to the next sync which sent it to a file. So um, these they're calling these uh, sources that uh, get their output from nothing to be generators you, you know I mean a sine wave source a PWM pulse width modulated source or a noise source uh, I think I have yeah so here's what the noise the noise source sounds like and again notice they've put the gain at 0 0.1 because the noise source is going to generate this horrible noise, white noise, at full volume level, right? So we don't want that smashing into our eardrums. So if we try this, noise MRS, white noise, okay? Not, not too harsh on the ears, but still noise. Now, the next thing that you want to do is... Um, you want to do some kind of processing and in their um, example here this uh, one pole which is a simple first order first degree linear filter so it has in, in signal processing terms it has a single pole and so take the noise reduce the amplitude with a gain and then send it into a filter and then send that back out to uh, the speakers Let's see did I save that one I think I called it one pole yes so if we Marcius run and one pole so that's not quite as harsh as the noise because it's been filtered so some of the you can you can tell that this one the the higher frequency components of the noise have been dropped out due to the one pole filter now that's all good and dandy um, but usually you you don't want to process audio forever so in this scripting language you can label a node and then if you um, introduce uh, a control called done and we're referencing the has data property of the labeled input node and we're checking to see if that is equal to false so in this network what they've what they've done is wired it up so we're gonna have a name that we can use to reference this sound file source processor well, it's, a, it's a it's a source not a processor in their terminology uh, run it through something that computes the energy of that sound signal and then the values from the energy processor are not audio samples there are they are numerical values but they no longer represent an audio signal they represent a property of the audio signal so instead of syncing it to the speakers which wouldn't really make any sense they're syncing it to a, a CSV file and finally this control input that's been introduced called done is used to shut the whole network down once the input node no longer has data 
So let's see if I did I say that? I think I called it energy. Yes. So if we run this one. There's no audio output because nothing is syncing to the speakers. It ran for a little bit and it wrote the output into the CSV file as we told it. And um, it turns out that the CSV sync does not use a comma as the field separator. It, it, uh, by default, it uses space. So that's why there are spaces here instead of commas. Uh, personally, I think anything called CSV sync should use commas but you, you can change that by using a an additional parameter but this is the um, spectral energy computed for that sound file as we proceed through playback now you, if you've dealt with audio data before you might be asking yourself well wait a minute um, are these numbers here do they represent the spectral energy value once per sample or or what and the answer is that by default um, the data is sliced up into uh, I think they call them frames and the frames basically represent a buffer of multiple samples from the input so the energy processor computes the energy that's present in that uh, frame of samples and you can adjust the um, <coughs> excuse me you can adjust the number of samples that are in each frame in this example um, each number in the column represents the energy computed over 512 samples of audio from the sound file and the reason there are two values is because this is a stereo mp3 so this is the left channel energy and this is the right channel energy in the two values so each one of these rows represents 512 samples of audio and you notice it starts out uh, zero that's the silent part at the beginning of the file and then you'll see in here that like it went up to 8 and 13 and then it went down to 5 and 10 and then you know it went up again and then down again and that's because the beginning of this, if we just play it, so the beginning of that song has signal and then some silence and then signal and then some silence and then signal and then some silence as we're, you know, we're beginning this song. So that's what's showing up here in this power data. We're seeing high numbers and then low numbers the low numbers representing the part of the signal where nothing's really much going on it's just kind of the background of the track and so this is showing you how in a network you can trigger that the network finishes when the song finishes um, another kind of interesting you know kind of global analysis that you could do on things is to count zero crossings so um, the zero crossings are gonna tell you uh, it, it's basically telling you um, so what, are they, what did they describe it in here? I'm not an audio expert, so I, this is why I don't have this stuff memorized. Uh, it's similar to... Oh, now we're talking about power spectrum. Well, let's just try it. So if we look at... Uh, I think I've saved this out as zero crossings. So, again, we're just going to write the result out into the CSV file. As it processes the file, now you notice that it, I mean, this is like a three-minute song. <coughs> Excuse me.
excuse me. So it is uh, processing because it's not syncing to the speakers. It's processing the sound file in faster than real time. So, I mean, that, and and that's useful to us because you know if you're doing real time processing, you want <clears throat> to process the audio stream as fast as you can so that you can trigger something else happening in your program to respond to the audio stream. And you, we can. Uh, there's actually a a video out on YouTube where a guy did a student project where he hooked up Marcius to uh, arbitrary incoming audio and then by processing the audio and identifying uh, different beat patterns and things like that he programmed a robot to go dance around within a little uh, enclosure the the robot basically moves forward until it gets close to an obstacle and then it makes a turn uh, but uh, it's got arms that it kind of flails around uh, depending on the type of music that is being played so that's like an example of kind of high level processing that you might want to do with something like this. Uh, if we look at the zero crossings result, so these numbers here are represent an average of the number of times that the signal crossed zero, so either went from positive to negative or negative to positive, within the sample window. So these numbers, when they're really small, it means not much is going on, right? The signal is not oscillating very much. But as the number goes up, if we go farther down into the song, we see that, you know, and these are averages, so the value is scaled to like between 0 and 1. But we can see that, you know, here it was about 0 0.3 on each channel, but over just a little bit earlier, two frames earlier, it was zero about 0 0.09 on the left channel, 0 0.02 on the right channel. So it, it was... The signal was relatively quiet, and then it got active. Um, you can go further and pump into uh, a power spectrum. So a power spectrum gives you an idea of the amount of power present in the signal at different frequencies. When we looked at the energy of the signal, we were looking at its total energy across all frequencies for that window. So the, the energy result, we had a single value per channel. Uh, I've got the, what do I call it? Uh, I think I called it power spectrum. Yes. Now this is a little more computationally intensive, so it takes a little bit longer than just the computing that single scalar value that we were computing earlier. But it still processes in faster than real time, so we don't have to wait multiple minutes. But this is also a debug build, it's not optimized. We need a little Jeopardy theme song playing here. Okay, so now it's done. Now if we look at result, power spectrum. Now what we see is, and in this, uh, I'll show you my little network here. Uh, this time I added the separator equals comma for the CSV sync so that we got actual commas in the file. And if we look at that, oops. Result power. Okay, let me make this window a little bigger. So now what you see is um, each row of data contains a whole bunch of values separated by commas, and that represents the power at different frequencies in uh, equal intervals for each of the channels. And, you know, initially no power present because we're, we're starting up and then uh, the power spectrum evolves as the song plays. Now, if I had a, a, a I didn't um, investigate 
where this is. I know it exists, uh, but I didn't investigate where to get it. I think it's a third-party application on top of Marcius that uh, draws a nice little OpenGL frequency graph that scrolls over time as the song is playing. You know, obviously, if I have this power spectrum data, uh, and we're only looking at it after it's all been generated, but obviously it's being generated uh, as, as fast as it can before it sends it to the CSV sync. We're looking at it after all the input processing is done, but I could put more nodes in here to display this power spectrum in real time as it was as the song was playing or you know as I was just processing the file so you can you can start to see that I am extracting um, data from these sound files and processing them I can take the single stream of data put it into a parallel node and process a bunch of things in parallel extract different features in parallel join them all back up and sync them down to something that is going to do something specific for my application um, if you were wondering more about exactly how these uh, streams are shaped it, it's described here in the documentation but basically it's um, a two-dimensional array of numbers one of the dimensions being the number of channels in the input and the other dimension being the the sample within the frame and um, you can with command line arguments to Marcius run you can change the size of the uh, slice from the default to you know, 512 to 64 or whatever you want now <clears throat> each of these little parameters here that go onto these nodes each of these parameters is called a control uh, they have controls that are bools, inter integral numbers, real numbers, uh, 2D arrays of real numbers. Notice that uh, in this case a 2D array, so each of the array elements are separated with uh, commas and then uh, I guess the right way to say it is the array elements are separated with semicolons and then the values within the elements are separated with commas or strings where we can use to pass file names or whatever other kind of string data we might want to pass around now the parameters or sorry the controls within that are associated with these nodes they all have a strong data type so there's an error if you uh, try to use the wrong data type so there's no promotion of integers to floating points, for instance. The frequency control on the sign source is a real. So if you try to use an integer, it will give you an error. Uh, but you, you know, just fix that by adding decimal point on there to turn the integer into a real number. And um, every control has a default value. So it turns out the default value for the sign source is a frequency of 440 hertz and um, if you want to see what controls are available to you for a particular node RCS uh, info list controls sign source for instance so there's a bunch of controls that we don't know what they do yet I mean mute is pretty obvious debug you can probably guess what that does but the one that we saw used earlier was the frequency was down here but we also see things like uh, the number of input samples the number of uh, on samples I'm not sure what I'm not sure if on samples is output samples or not <coughs> and so if you just forget I mean it's not providing much documentation other than the names of the controls but if you were just like oh yeah I know there's a control for that on this um, Mars system I'm not sure what it's called again is it called frequency or is it just called FREQ so you can use that to list out the controls for a particular Mars system and of all of course everything that we're looking at here are all Mars systems that came as source so ultimately you can go look at the source code for these Mars systems to see 
uh, exactly how these controls are being used. Uh, and we'll look at some source code in a little bit here. Now, um, the other interesting thing about controls is you can assign a mathematical expression to compute the value of a control. So in this case, they wanted to have um, three sine waves generated in parallel where their frequencies are related so that they have a harmonic relationship between the frequencies. So here's the base frequency and then here's the third multiple which I uh, can't remember if they call that the first or the third harmonica. Again, I'm not an audio expert but I like playing around with stuff. So, And then next the, the fifth multiple of the base frequency and they're notice that they're also adjusting the gain so it's three times the frequency but one-third of the power of the base and then added on is five times the base frequency but at one-fifth the uh, I was saying power but it's actually volume one-fifth the volume of the base so this parallel uh, what did they call it they called it a like a complex or composite they called it a composite uh, Mars system so the parallel composite Mars system is going to result in one channel here with this frequency another channel here with this uh, multiply 3 frequency and then a third channel with this multiply 5 frequency so they pass that all down into a mix to mono before they send it to the speakers and I think I have that one laying around here I could type harmonic okay so for our first attempt uh, just in case you try and reproduce this from their tutorial the gain parameter is a real number but in this uh, call out it's given as an integer so you have to fix that I've fixed it here um, these other ones he they mixed an integer with a a real number and then when the math is done it results in a real number now for an expression to be used you must include the parentheses that encapsulate the whole expression uh, it's not optional it's just how the parser figures out you're doing an expression instead of just uh, a single value so if we run this our sys run Okay, doesn't sound too exciting, but um, what would be nice is if we could combine these things to say, you know what, I, I don't like having to repeat myself to repeat this base frequency three times. What would be nice is a way if we could provide named values so that we can have one place where we change the base frequency and then the harmonics naturally follow suit. So, we can do that uh, How is that one different? Oh, here they're giving a name to the sign source that is uh, generating the base frequency and what they're doing is referencing the frequency control so this is the name of the control and this is the path to this named node. So if we look at that, that's what I've done here. Again, I had to fix up the, the gain has to be a real number. And if we run this, okay, same output, but now if I want to change the frequency, I only have to change it in one place. Uh, in fact, he put parentheses around this value here, so it, it didn't actually have to be parenthesized to just kind of for consistency, I guess, is the way they just decided to do that. Now, what if you want to have a single global control on the whole network that you name yourself? In this, in this example, the fact that it was called frequency, we were restricted to using that name because it's the con named control of the sign source but we might have um, 
parameters that we want to name with our own names you know we might want to call it you know base freak or, or whatever we can do that by adding our own controls into uh, the whole network and so here when we set the frequency parameter of the sign source we're setting it to the named uh, control from the global level so it's slash frequency now instead of slash base slash frequency where base was the name of our sign source that had the base frequency component so now we've got uh, frequency and amplitude and the first harmonic or the or the base frequency is at the frequency with an amplitude divided by one uh, again the divide by one isn't strictly needed here but they're doing it to uh, also he's missing a slash here before this amplitude it's another thing I, I fixed locally uh, but we're taking the amplitude and dividing it by one and then three times the frequency with the amplitude divided by three and then five times the frequency with the amplitude divided by five so this divide by one is not strictly necessary it's just there to show the relationship between the harmonics so I've got over here harmonic three where I had to fix this reference to the amplitude control that's at the global uh, level and if we run this okay frequency of 360 with a uh, three times harmonic and a five times harmonic but now that I've got a named control at the top level I can run this again and supply an override for that value and I can say frequency equals uh, I don't know 2000 so now it's uh, at a much higher base frequency so now I've taken this little graph that was taking the original frequency uh, third harmonic and the fifth harmonic mixing them together I've parameterized that into a little reusable module that I can use for any frequency it's it's got a default frequency but it's not fixed at a specific frequency I can also make it a little louder by changing the amplitude uh, it's not too loud let's just do 0 0.25 so we'll just do this for again for comparison that was quieter right the, the original value was quieter because he's an amplitude of 0 0.1 now the more interesting part is when controls are or or yeah controls are not just inputs from a Mars system but an output so revisiting this earlier example where we had a sound file being played and then it stopped when the sound file ran out of data the sound file source has a if we go look at it we can say Marcius info list control sound file source uh, what did I do wrong help uh, it's plural okay controls sound file source we see here's this has data and it's a boolean and the default is true so it starts out true and then it changes its value dynamically to false when the end of the sound file is reached and notice here that this sound file source did not have any value specified for the file name control so we gave that Mars system a name with we called it input so we specified that the control on the input Mars system its control called file name has a value of the string uh, cool slash sound dot wave I mean I've got a sound.mp3 file here that I've been using and so any network that we build up we can supply default values but we can also override those on the command line and those
control values can be updated dynamically by the nodes in the network and that can be used to publish uh, basically events to other nodes to let them do things this uh, done control is especially is a special uh, control that is recognized by the uh, the player here Marcius run that's running the network and when this done control is set to true it basically causes the whole network to exit now <clears throat> A more interesting case here is use of this flow to control uh, Mars system and what it does is it takes the input stream and turns it into a control so now we can have one part of the network reference values from the input stream that are computed elsewhere in the network and use that as a control. So here what they're doing is taking a sound file, turning it into mono. So if it was a stereo with two channels, it now be, it's now mixed down to a mono channel with, uh, or a mono file, mono stream with just one channel. And then that is fanned out to a series stream that computes the RMS energy and then that energy is piped into flow to control and that flow to control node is labeled as with the name energy so the fan out is doing both of these in parallel so one of the things it's doing is computing the RMS energy of the stream and turning that into a control the other part is saying I'm going to do some processing. Uh, let me highlight this differently. I'm going to do some processing and then I'm going to send that to the speaker. The processing is doing a fan out again of taking the input signal, sending it to a gain of 0 0.1, and then also sending it to a series composite that takes a noise source. So remember, when you have a source followed by another source, the second source replaces the first stream that was provided by the other source. So we had the sound file source, it was going into this fan out, one of the fan outs was going into this series, that was going into another fan out, and one of the nodes in the fan out is another series, and then it replaces the uh, uh, sound file source data with noise source. But it uses a gain node to say set the gain to be the value of the energy RMS energy that was computed earlier multiply that times 0 0.5 and then send that to the speakers <coughs> so what you get is the sound file is mixed down to mono on the left hand side and the right hand side is a modulated noise source whose gain is following the energy contour of the sound file that you're hearing on the left hand side so I've got this one saved over here a flow to control so this is just exactly what we have over here we got the sound file source it's reading my little sound file mix to mono and then fan out into one branch of the fan out is going to compute the RMS energy and turn that into a control and the other one is going to produce one channel with the reduced gain of the sound file and then the other channel will have a noise source that's modulated by the gain who's it's modulated with a gain that is coming from the energy of the original mono signal. So if we try this, Marcius run, flow to control. You can hear that if you're listening on headphones, it's very obvious that the right channel is just a noise source whose um, gain is modulated by the amount of energy present in 
the left hand channel so now things are starting to get a little more interesting right we've got one part of this flow graph computing something and that's used to control another part of the flow graph and we did it by taking the input stream of audio samples turning that into a stream of RMS uh, energy values and then we turned the energy values from a stream input we turned them into a control input so that we could access that control to parameterize the control of another node um, termination of the script again as we just said it's when that has data goes to uh, true and the root uh, in the chat it says pretty sure the sound is coming to us as mono it could be the way that my sound is being shared um, when it goes up onto YouTube it should be recorded in stereo uh, I can't control how uh, Jitsi decides to take my audio and mux it out to the internet they may be, they may be turning it into uh, a mono um, but I, in, all I can tell you is in my headphones I can hear it clearly the noise modulated noise channel on the right and when you run it locally yourself you you will hear that too um, okay so now there's more advanced processing that we can do here I'm not gonna drill into this too much you know they kinda you know like hey it's open source you know hey contribute some documentation <coughs> excuse me but what I want to show you next is what some of this looks like in source code so um, also we will look at over here in the user manual actually let's look at the user manual a little bit um, so that tutorial that just kind of giving you an overview of how these these flow networks are set up and you know how controls work and how the Mars systems are named and how uh, fan out works so on uh, in the user manual there's um, there's some build instructions um, I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, something that I use to make the build simpler uh, for me like you know kind of leveraging what they'd already done um, let's get down to something more advanced here so under uh, feature extraction they have a tool called IBT and this is uh, what they call uh, INESC Porto Beat Tracker now because this documentation and this system comes from somebody who's doing graduate level research in music analysis and uh, for information retrieval systems music information retrieval and so on if you think about it it's like how do those apps work where you play a little bit of a song into your phone and then it tells you what song it is and it tells you so quickly that clearly it didn't do a brute force database search of that sound sample it did something more and what they did was they did feature extraction you played the music into your phone it said oh it's 120 beats per minute okay now I can eliminate all the songs that aren't 120 beats per minute you know maybe it further uh, processes it using an AI recognizer if you think about it um, AI machine learning based classification is I give you a bunch of data and you classify it well that's nothing more than I played you a song and I want you to classify it into the name of the song if you have a big enough neural network that's trained well enough on enough music it can certainly do that but if you if you're not that lucky right you don't have access to the entire Columbia music archive you just have uh, what you can do on your own an isolated analysis maybe it's just enough to say like oh I, I just want to extract out how many beats per minute is in the song because I'm gonna have a little kind of Winamp plugin that's gonna do something interesting in sync with the beat so I need to know how many beats per minute it is to synchronize my graphic presentation so if we go over here we see that one of the executables that we built was IBT when we told it to build everything and so if we run IBT on our little 
sound file. It does its thing. Again, this is a debug build, so it's not built for optimized anything, right? It's just running real, you know, simplistically. <coughs> Excuse me. If we look at the sound median tempo, it says, hey, that song is 120 beats per minute. If we look at uh, sound.text, this is giving us the times in seconds, I believe, when the beat was detected. So if we were running this as part of our own sound processing network, we would be getting one of these samples every time it detected a beat. And, you know, it just goes on here. So that sounds like, you know, some pretty high-level, sophisticated stuff. What does that actually look like in terms of the source code? Uh, well, we can look at that. We've got the source card over here. Oops, let me get over to it. Here we go. Now, I didn't mention anything about building this yet. Um, what I did is I've got the source code downloaded here. Let's just go over to this view. I think it might be a little easier to see. I'm not sure. So I've got the source code. I've got my build directory. It's got a CMake based build, so it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've discussed, you know, using CMake to build projects before. And so it's going to be the normal CMake build process, right? You're going to configure it and then after you've configured it, you will generate to get build scripts, and then you'll run the build scripts to get your build. Now, I built it several different ways. One way I built it was just to use open folder in Visual Studio, and then tell CMake to go configure itself and run, and that was all fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um... And one of the things that Marcius looks for is, at least on Windows, it looks for the direct sound libraries to be able to send stuff to the speakers. That's how it's talking to the speakers, is through the direct sound API, which is part of DirectX. And uh, it'll be something different on Linux or Mac OS, but on Windows, that's what it's using. And um, normally, when I have a command prompt, I uh, like my little shell here. I normally don't have all of the Visual Studio like, you know, include and library environment variables and stuff set over here because uh, I like to kind of keep my environment as clean as possible, as few things sneaking in through the environment as I can. But when you configure with CMake in that, inv in that sort of setup, right, because it doesn't have the include directory variable set in the environment and it doesn't have the lib variable set in the environment it's not pointing to the Windows SDK locations and so therefore when you configure it without you know, pointing it to those locations in some specific way it says I couldn't find direct sound and it couldn't compile uh, the code that wants to sync file or, or sync audio data to your speaker so just be uh, advised that if you're doing this on Windows and you get an error about like it couldn't find direct sound that's the source of that problem now the next problem you might run into is you might say hey I want to be able to decode mp3 inputs and play those back and as you might or might not be aware mp3 algorithms are patented and they have license holders and you can't just um, do that out of the box necessarily uh, you have to go and get a library to support that and the one that they use in Marcius is called libmad 
and that's uh, an audio decoding library that decodes uh, MPEG level audio, so MP3. However, libmad, as distributed in source code form, only comes with like a Unix style configure script. It doesn't come with the CMake files and it doesn't come with Windows uh, Visual Studio projects. So, the next wrinkle is how do you get that wired in? Well, that's when VC package comes to the rescue. So, I did VC package search for libmad. And there it is, high quality MPEG audio decoder. That's the library that we wanted. So what I did was install libmad locally with VC package. And then I have made a little batch file just to make my life easier that runs CMake with the necessary command line arguments to glue it into VC packages package system. So now when Marcius looks for libmad in the configure stage of CMake, because I've supplied this toolchain file, it will search in the locations where Visual Studio has built the libmad library and then it will find it. Now finding it is is all good and dandy, but um, we also have to tell Marcius that we want to use libmad and they have that you'll notice here there's a bunch of config variables that begin with Marcius these are uh, controlling various different aspects of the build you can go and look at their CMake lists if you want to see what those are really doing but the one that we wanted was with mad so I reconfigured again with this turned on and as long as I was configuring pointing CMake to my VC package installation when I reconfigured Marcius to say use libmad it found it. So that's how I was able to get MP3 audio support out of the box. Now if you go and get the Marcius code yourself and download it it won't have libmad bundled with it and it, if you if you just build it minimally out of the out of github like that you'll get wave file playback but you won't get mp3 file playback so if you're wondering as you're experimenting with this why it won't read any mp3 files that's why you didn't configure it with libmad and you didn't get libmad from somewhere now the nice thing about vc packages when i told it to go get libmad it just went and got it all and uh, i mean i um if you look here, I had, uh, let's go back up here. I had downloaded it just to see what it looked like to see if, and I was like, oh, let's just download it and see if it has a CMake list. Well, it doesn't. It's all um, auto config, config.h.in, configure script, configure.ac. These are all things telling you it's built with and using GNU autoconf tools. Um, oh, I didn't notice there was an MSVC directory that had, a look at this as a VC6 project. That's a project file that's like 20 years old. Uh, VC6 I think um, is like circa 1998. So that's al almost 25 years old. Wow, okay. So obviously this library has been around for a while or they just don't like updating their compiler. At any rate, figuring out all this build crap is always just a giant pain in the butt. And so my f first solution these days is just to go look to see if VC package has support for that. Oh, got to say search. And since it did, I was like, great, now I don't need to think about the build. I don't need to worry about it. I can just get on with my life and install the package. VC uh, package will download the source code, compile it locally, put the compiled libraries and include files in the right place. So CMake will find them when we use that tool chain argument. And um, I'm using a batch file here to do this. But if you're using the CMake GUI, you would just put this information into the CMake GUI when you configure it. This is, ju this is just a CMake variable like any other variable. It's just pointing to the location of this vcpackage.cmake file that acts like a tool chain. And by acting like a tool chain, that's how vcpackage is able to hook the configuration process 
to point things to where VC package has put the includes and the libraries. So next I wanted to have access to any of the GUI tools that came with Marcius and these are not uh, again enabled by default because they require a GUI toolkit which you may or may not have in Marcius that toolkit is QT so again I did the same thing I said VC package search for QT5 and there's one big global QT5 that gets like the whole framework and if you've ever built QT yourself you know how much of a time saver this is if you only wanted to get individual components from QT piecemeal you can do QT5 and then put in brackets the individual pieces that you want I wasn't sure which pieces Marcius wanted so I just said go ahead and download and install QT5 it took quite a while not the downloading the building because QT is a very large package and its build is non-trivial again if you've ever built QT 5 or 4 or 3 for that matter any any release of QT really if you've ever built it yourself from scratch then you'll really appreciate how much of a headache uh, VC package is saving you so having done that downloaded and built libmad download and built QT 5 when I go back into the configure I'm just using CMake GUI here you can do it from the command line as well I just go back and reconfigure I turned on the with QT variable and then reconfigured regenerated and rebuilt and that gave me if we go look here in the debug directory Excuse me. That gave me um, the GUI based applications that they ship. So I can open this up and open up sound.mp3. It's playing the sound file. I can now use this little slider. I should be able to. Huh. It appears this little slider isn't doing what I thought. I thought it would let me skip to a portion of the song, but apparently apparently it did not. But the GUI based tools, you can get access to them if you install QT5. That's not what we want to do. We want to exit out. So, uh, just a couple comments, you know, some things to look out for if you're trying to build this from scratch yourself and you're wondering like, hey, they were talking about some Mar player application in the documentation. How come that's not in my build folder? And it's because you didn't configure pointing to a built copy of QT5. Now, <clears throat> they have a little uh, Hello World application, which we can take a look at here. It's a really simple example. So it is doing, they're making a uh, Mars System Manager. This is the a, a global, this is an object that represents the entire global graph, right? So what we're going to do is build nodes and add them to this global network. So um, first thing they're doing is creating a series node which they're calling network. They're going to add to that network a signed source node that they're calling SRC and then add an audio sync and a sound file sync. So uh, essentially this is looking like let me just do it this way as a comment. It's looking like series with sign source that they're calling source and then that goes into audio sync which they're calling dest and that is also followed by dest2 that goes to a sound file sync so this little network is what these four lines of code create so that's nice that's pretty succinct and uh, straightforward. I don't have to worry a lot about uh, details of 
this uh, system. I can, you know, my, my little script here looks very similar to the C++ code that I'm writing here. So that's good because that means if I see a script written by somebody else, I understand how to turn that into C++ code if I need to. Uh, down here, they're updating a control. Um, this MRS natural, this MRS is Marcius prefix, and this MRS natural is the type of data. So natural is a natural number. It's um, an integer, right? And then the name of the control is in samples, and this is going on the entire network right it's it's this uh, series that we created up at the top so it's this whole oh yeah this thing was called network just to make that match and then um, the frequency on the sign source setting it to 440 Hertz uh, setting the uh, input sample rate and whether or not uh, I'm not I'm not sure what init audio does to be honest I'd have to go look that up but the more more important parameter or control rather is the file name control so now the whole network has been configured and the control values have been set so they're just gonna do uh, an infinite loop here that runs the network now notice that um, you know my IDE down here is saying hey you're not even gonna reach this code and that's true because this while loop will never exit we're not checking to see if the network is done or not but for a simple uh, example this does just fine let's change the name of this to sound dot mp3 and build hello world build Okay, so it's built, and if I go back over here and I say hello world, it's playing the sign source at 440 hertz. It will play it forever until I control C it, which I did, because we don't need to hear it at infinitum. So that's pretty nice. This has a pretty nice high level API that lets me configure these networks in C code that looks almost line for line just like the scripts that we were writing. So once I've prototyped something with a script and I want to take it into a canned application, I can just go from straight from my script into C++ or you can certainly just make like a batch file that just runs Marcius run. If, if everything you need to do can be done from the script, then great. Um, which might be the case if you wrote custom processing nodes to act as custom syncs for the, the data computed by your flow or, or or the network, however you want to call it. But what's more interesting is we saw this high-level processor called IBT, right? And this thing computed, you know, it gave us this sound median tempo. It told us that our sound file was 120 beats per minute. So you might think like IBT has probably got some kind of a lot of custom code in there to figure that out. Well, if we look at the source file for IBT, it's it's only got one source file, so it can't be too huge. And if we look down in it, okay, a bunch of help stuff, uh, options, but here's the main processing. It's going to take a file name that is the sound file and another string that is the output file. Oh, and look what it's doing. It's creating the manager, which is used as a factory to get all the other nodes. So it's calling create. It's going to do a series called audio flow and audio flow will have added onto it an audio source or a sound file source depending on whether we're doing mic input or whether we're doing sound file input then it will go stereo to mono and then it will do flow through and again all these nodes are just going to be added in 
and configured to compute the information that we want. So first they create all the nodes. So you see there's obviously this uh, computing the beats per minute is non-trivial, right? We've got to do a significant amount of processing. So there's quite a bit of nodes in here. After all the nodes are created, they'll link up all the controls. Uh, so here the way they're using link control that's linking two controls together. And after all the controls are connected all together on all the nodes, then they will be... I was expecting to see... Okay, so there's some update control nodes or, or uh, function calls that are made as well to set various other parameters. More control linking. More control updating. Obviously, this is a complex network, so the number of controls and parameters that have to be all wired up together is not small. I'm just trying to find the end of this giant function here, which is probably the rest of this file. All right, here we go. So after everything is all set up, uh, and then it runs the network, After the network is all finished, it deletes the top level network. So, uh, similar to GUI libraries, that when you add child GUI elements to a parent, so buttons on a dialog, for instance, you don't need to individually delete the, the buttons in order to clean up the resource. So, when you add a button to a dialog in QT, for instance, the dialog becomes the owner of the button. You can hold on to that pointer to the raw button if you want to in order to interact with the button. But when you clean up the GUI, you just delete the dialog. You don't need to delete all the individual controls in the dialog because the, the dialog has already taken ownership of those controls. Same with these flow networks. Once you add um, Mars systems into a network that network owns the Mars system that you added so you don't need to keep references to all those individual nodes and delete them all yourself you just delete the top level guy here and that will clean up everything now they could have done uh, if we, let's just drill in here it was a lot earlier in the file up here I mean they could have used you know stood unique pointer to uh, not have to remember to delete the network in case of a thrown exception or something like that uh, a a RAII style pointer class would have been better here but that's a, a minor nit on this code um, although this is a complicated amount of setup it's only proportional to the complexity of the network it's no more complex than the network itself that was used to do this beat detection. But what is I find more interesting is if I wanted to combine beat detection into my own code, I could use the source code for IBT as a starting point. Uh, and if I were to customize this algorithm, what I would probably do is go and take this uh, C++ code that's creating the network in code I would create a script that corresponds to the C++ code and then I could experiment with the script and once I had a version of the script that was modified the way I wanted to see it I could uh, turn that back into C++ code or just use Marcius Run or what have you. Now obviously musical music analysis and sound file analysis is a huge topic and not something that uh, I can it's not even something that I'm an expert in, so I can't explain it to you because I, I don't necessarily understand all of it myself. But if I knew that I needed to do some simplistic analysis like beat extraction, I wanted to get beat times. Well, that's coming straight out of this existing code that we're looking at right here. So I could adapt this code into my own application to let me understand... Um, or, or to let me extract that information so that I could trigger events in my code when I needed to. Now, 
the next level of drilling in would be, well, suppose there's no existing Mars system that does what I want, and I need to add my own. So uh, this Mars, Marcius target here, this is a library that contains all the built-in Mars systems that are available. And if we look at uh, the sine wave source, is a pretty simple example to start with. So if we just keep going down here. So here is sine source. And it's only like, you know, 100 lines of code in this file, including blank lines and a big comment block. So it's obviously not that complicated. Basically, there's uh, an update function and a process function, and that's it. That's the main guts. What this particular implementation is doing is using a... Uh, a table that they have filled with values from sine uh, a sine wave and when they're processing um, they have this data type called real vec that basically represents a vector of real valued samples and what they're doing here is running over the samples and computing or, or copying in the values that they computed from their wavetable. So what the reason they've kind of split it up this way is so that um, they generate a table uh, of 8k values for a single sine wave because uh, a sine wave signal is periodic so we don't need to do dynamic computations on the fly for that. And then when they um, are processing they're just taking the values from the wavetable and copying them into the output and then advancing on to the next index so that's pretty straightforward in terms of understanding how to implement your own node I mean obviously this stuff is documented in their doxygen but if you need to create your own custom Mars system for instance, you might want to have a custom Mars system so that you can sync data to a custom hardware interface instead of just the speakers. You might want to sync it to something else. Maybe you've got data flow that needs to be sunk to, you know, the, the dancing robot example is, is one. You know, you need to sync a data stream to the motors that are driving the, the joints in the robot to make it dance. Um, so it's a pretty flexible and uh, rich set of stuff to get started and if what you need to do isn't exactly built in you need to do something a little custom it's not that hard to write a new Mars system and glue it into this whole setup and I find that pretty interesting because I, as I've said a couple of times now, I'm, I'm not an audio expert and it's really easy to get lost in the terminology because it's domain specific and I'm not an expert in the domain in, in terms of music analysis. I mean, it's, it's not so hard to follow things like beats per minute. That's something that most people are familiar with as a, con as a concept anyway. But when we get into more, uh, advanced music analysis frameworks they they um, they kind of start losing me because I'm not familiar with the jargon and the terms but I liked that this library had built in a lot of tools and uh, processing options available to me so that even if I'm not an expert I don't have to become an expert to play around with things and experiment and maybe find something that works maybe it's not the most elegant solution maybe it's a little bit hacky but if I'm just doing an art project, the biggest impediment to me reaching my goal is to get something that works. Uh, I'm not trying to be an academic researcher and find the most elegant solution. If I can find something that works and it's good enough, then that's going to be fine for my art project because I'm not going to be, um, you know, turning the, it's an art project. It's a one-off installation. It's not going to be something that needs to be turned into a product. Uh, 
uh, it's more important that things work and that it's easy for me to prototype and experiment and get to a working solution as quickly as possible. So that was one thing that I found was was nice about this library. Um, that's the end of what I have prepared to show you. So if there's any questions or comments, we can go to that now, either in the chat or by audio. Okay, since there doesn't seem to be any questions, we will wrap it up there.